The biggest change, Peter Bergen argues, is that today non-state armed groups not only just control their attacks. Thanks to digital media technology, they now also control the coverage of the attack and the distribution of that coverage. They no longer depend on the traditional media to provide them with the oxygen of publicity. They have, as Bergen argues, merged with the media. They are the media. This has not always been the case. Only a few years back, the media environment in which non-state armed groups operated looked fundamentally different. So what exactly has changed and how? To get a better sense of the magnitude of these changes, we need to take a closer look at the evolution of the media strategies of non-state armed groups. And to do this, we trace pivotal moments that occurred across the world over the last 50 or so years. Our starting point is Munich, Germany, in 1972. During the Summer Olympics, the Palestinian terrorist group Black September took hostages and eventually killed 11 members of the Israeli Olympic team. This was a pivotal moment in the history of terrorism as it showed the tendency of non-state armed groups to use whatever the medium of the time is. During the Munich Olympics, it was the first time in 1972, it was the first time that live color television was covering something in a very systematic way. And the Palestinian terrorists used that as an opportunity to kidnap and then later uh, the, the group of Israeli athletes who, were then, who then died. Um, and that was probably the most watched event in human history to that point, because about a billion people were watching the Olympics in 1972. And you had, because of live color television, you were able to cover the event for the first time in live color television, which had never happened before for a terrorist attack. The live broadcast in front of the world's eyes helped bring the Palestinian cause to the attention of the world in a way that nothing else had done in the past. And while public viewers were appalled by the attacks, the situation in Palestine all of a sudden received a lot more media attention. Our next stop is Hezbollah in the 1980s. Founded in response to the 1982 Israeli invasion and occupation of Lebanon, Hezbollah has generally been credited by both terrorism and media scholars to have operated one of the most professional and sophisticated media strategies ever developed by a non-state actor at the time. At the core of its military operations was a professional media committee. Consisting of nine media professionals, the media committee held the ultimate decision-making power over whether and how any military attack was to be conducted. And the core principle driving its operation was that unless an attack could be mediatized through at least two camera angles, no such attack would take place. This shows the centrality of the media in the execution of violent acts. For violence to be executed, it needed to be filmed and mediatized. The importance is not the violent act in itself, but the filming and dissemination of the violent act. The structure and principles first developed by Hezbollah in the 1980s were copied during the 1990s by Al-Qaeda, whose media committee Al-Sahab was tasked with relaying the terror organization's views to the world. It is important here to emphasize that there is no connection between Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda. In the late 1990s, Al-Qaeda had a very traditional, old-school approach to how it saw and used the media. In their very rare media appearances, they focused primarily on traditional media outlets. So Al-Qaeda in the late 90s was, you know, CNN, they did an interview with Time Magazine, they did an interview with ABC News. This is a very traditional media news environment. 
They didn't do very many interviews, uh, but uh, they did these on very big media platforms. Then, following the foundation of Al Jazeera in 1996, Al Qaeda shifted to using the Qatar based news network as its main conduit. Bin Laden gave several interviews on Al Jazeera, and Al Jazeera started producing documentaries about him. After 9 11, Al Qaeda stopped doing interviews with Western media. Probably because they didn't trust Western media, and because, as could be seen in the execution of the Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Pearl in early 2002, they viewed Western media as a target. Instead, Al Qaeda typically would shoot their own videotapes so that they could control their message completely. They would then send them by courier and drop them off at an Al Jazeera office in Pakistan. And contrary to popular belief, Al Jazeera was quite careful not to be used as a propaganda platform for Al Qaeda. They didn't necessarily show all the Bin Laden tapes. They used highlights. And then the Western media would pick up those highlights and show them themselves. So Al-Qaeda Al was very much a, the media strategy they had was uh, cable news, satellite news, traditional media outlets. Uh, they never really changed their policy. Uh, they never really adapted social media. Uh, Al-Qaeda Central, the group that attacked at US on 9-11, they, uh, they tended to do very boring lectures by Al-Qaeda's now number one, Ayman al-Zawari. Their, their approach was, we'll do an hour lecture, and we'll put that out on the internet. And it was a very boring, uh, no one paid any attention to these. So often, you know, if it was bin Laden, there was more attention. But Al-Qaeda Central, the organization had a pretty tedious uh, kind of approach to propaganda. The first Al-Qaeda generation was very old school in their approach to media. Having come of age in the pre-digital world, they never really adapted to the possibilities of cyberspace and digital new media. In that way, they were classical digital migrants, not digital natives. <laughs>